This is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. So I'm taking a momentary break right now from my continuing long series on the origins of the First World War. If you have not already listened, I've posted lectures discussing the history and politics of the Ottoman Empire, Serbia, Austria-Hungary, and the most recent, examining Bosnia and the events leading up to the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was posted on Patreon for patrons only. So please sign up at any level, even if it's just a dollar, to hear that one and all the other patron-only materials. But as I go on with that series on the origins of the First World War, I will still round out the current cycle of my repeating series on Myths of the Month, Doorways in Time, on the Great Archaeological Discoveries, and the History of the United States in 100 Objects. And so this will be the next installment in Doorways in Time, the Great Archaeological Discoveries, number seven, the Antikythera Mechanism, and this lecture will be brought to you by the letter J. So the Antikythera Mechanism is possibly the most complex and the most technical subject that I've ever tried to examine in this podcast, and I find that it's a very difficult subject to distill and then explain verbally. So this is a tremendous challenge for me, but I hope that it will be fun to record and to listen to anyway. I have in front of me a big stack of notes in a complicated outline, but even still in making this outline, I found that at a certain point, once I got to trying to explain the function and meaning of the sorrow style and the cycle of eclipses, it was simply too complex and multidimensional to even put down in an outline and I'm going to have to at some point put the notes down and start winging it and try to explain things improvisationally as I go. So we'll see how this works out. And it happens that I chose this subject several weeks ago before I had any idea what the latest Indiana Jones movie was about and the fact that it involved a so-called dial of destiny associated with Archimedes and clearly inspired by the Antikythera mechanism, and I have not seen the movie, I'm not going to comment on it any further, but maybe this will be of some use to people who have seen it or heard about it and are interested in knowing the actual facts about the real object. So to begin with, what is that object? What is the so-called Antikythera mechanism? It is a gear-driven, metal and wood, astronomical computing machine made in early Roman-era Greece, probably around 60 to 100 years BC, and designed to track and forecast celestial events in time with a lunisolar calendar system. It has been called the greatest scientific wonder of the ancient world. It is the one surviving specimen of advanced calculating technology from the Greco-Roman world, and it is likely the key to an entire lost industry of astronomical and computational machines, probably made in workshops in the Aegean Islands in the Hellenistic and Roman eras. So how was this unique machine discovered? Well, that story goes back more than 100 years. In the later 1800s, many Greek mariners, both within the Kingdom of Greece and in Ottoman territory around the Aegean, worked as sponge divers. And they would habitually set out in small teams around the Aegean Sea, where they would dive often dozens of feet underwater to collect live sponges from the sea floor. Some of these diving teams also crossed seasonally in the summer months to the southern side of the Mediterranean to dive for sponges on the coasts of Libya and Tunisia and then return in the autumn. It seems that by the later 19th century, many sponge fields, especially at the shallower depths, would become depleted over the course of the year. And the great challenge for divers was to reach deeper, to where there would still be fresh fields. New divers could go down about 150 feet under the water. The strongest and most seasoned divers could sometimes stay under the water for up to about four minutes. But most divers could only stay down for about one minute, leaving in effect only seconds to reach the sponges on the sea floor. 
And so in the 1890s, the most advanced and state-of-the-art sponge diving teams would also use full-body diving suits, including spherical copper helmets connected in turn to long hoses that would run up to the boat on the surface in order to bring a little bit of air into the helmet. These suits would allow divers to go as deep as 200 feet and for as long as five minutes at a time. But this was still highly dangerous, with great risks of decompression sickness if one surfaced too quickly, and also, of course, from drowning if cut off from the boat in rough seas and surf. In the spring of 1900, a diving team of seven or eight men who hailed from the island of Simi in the eastern Aegean Sea set out in a 50-foot boat called the Eferpi under the command of the captain Dimitrios Kontos in order to collect sponges around the Greek islands and also the coast of Libya and Tunisia in North Africa. At some point in that year of 1900, either in the spring on their way out of the Aegean Sea or in the autumn on the way back, the reports are unclear and inconsistent, but at some point that year they stopped over at the small island of Antikythera, which is located in the straits between the larger island of Crete to the south and the Greek mainland to the north. Due to its location, many ships would pass by Antikythera on their way westward towards Italy or southward to Africa. But very few boats ever stopped at the island because it was very rocky, largely barren, and barely inhabited. Much of the shore consists in steep cliffs, which then underwater drop off very quickly to great depths. The crew of the Eferpi undertook to dive at a spot on the northeastern corner of Antikythera facing towards the Aegean Sea. It seems that they went into deep waters that were located only about 75 feet off from the shore, but nonetheless were very deep. And while the divers were scouring the seafloor for sponges, one of them, who was named Ilias Stadiatis, noticed chunks of bronze resting on a steep slope. Soon after, the captain, Kontos, also put on a suit and began diving as well in order to look around the scene. And within that same day, someone, either Kontos or Stadiatis, we don't know for sure, hauled up from the sea floor to the boat an oblong piece of cast bronze, which turned out to be the arm of a large bronze sculptural figure. With a few more dives, they realized that they had discovered the debris of a large ancient shipwreck, which could be enormously historically significant as well as valuable. In October of 1900, they returned home to the island of Simi. They kept the exact location of the wreck that they had found secret, but they reached out to a professor of archaeology at the University of Athens named Antonios Oikonomos, who happened to be from the same island of Simi, so they had a certain degree of commonality with him. The professor procured for the team a meeting with the Greek Minister of Education, Spiridon Stais, and in this meeting the diving team offered to recover the rest of the artifacts and to hand them over to the Greek state in return for a reasonable pay and the use of naval ships and equipment. On November 24th, a Greek newspaper called Toasti reported that the diving team had closed a deal with the government, specifically with the Ministry of Education, and as part of that deal they had handed over the bronze arm, which in later years was found to be part of a life-sized statue of a young man who has come to be called the Antikythera Ephebe. A Greek naval ship, the Mikali, was dispatched to take the team and Professor Orkonamos down to the shores of Antikythera to begin the excavation and salvage of the ancient shipwreck. Over the next six months, divers went down repeatedly in hundreds of sorties, having to work only a few hours at a time through rough and dangerous weather, because this was the winter part of the year, which tended to be much more rough and dangerous on the Aegean Sea. By the end of December 1900, they had recovered many more pieces of the Ephebe, or Statue of the Young Man, and also the head of a statue of a mature bearded man, which has come to be called the Philosopher. In addition, they recovered many more bronze figurines and many fragments of bronze, marble, and blown glassware, as well as large ceramic storage jars or amphorae that were used to carry wine and oil around the Mediterranean Sea. By the spring of 1901, the picture of the shipwreck began to fall into place and has gradually been reconstructed over the years since. 
The vessel was a fairly large one, about 165 feet long, which went down while passing by the island of Antikythera sometime between about 90 BC and 50 BC, in other words, in the early period of Roman rule in Greece. It was laden with a wide assortment of luxury goods collected from all over Greece, some of them fairly new, while others, such as the two bronze statues, were already quite old, dating back to the 300s BC. Early on, excavators suspected that the ship might have been a Roman raiding ship that was taking back loot from recently conquered areas of Greece back to Rome. But little by little, it became clear that this was not true at all. Rather, it was a merchant ship carrying selected luxury goods, including a few antiques, and carefully assembling them, some of them, like the glass vessels, also coming ultimately from farther away, namely from the Near East, Lebanon or Syria. And the ship also carried a few civilian passengers, including a lady who had with her two pairs of gold earrings, and a man with his savings on his person in the form of a purse full of gold coins. Perhaps the two might have been a couple. Evidently, the ship went down in a storm on its way westward, probably as it was intending to take the goods to the west, including to Rome, where there was at this time a growing craze for Greek styles and objects among the upper classes of the Roman Republic, and where some of the items had probably already been specifically requested by specific collectors in Rome. Over the first half of 1900, hundreds of objects, many of them priceless, were surfaced, sorted through, and then shipped and transported to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens for examination, conservation, and cataloging. Greek newspapers regularly printed reports and dispatches trumpeting the incredible finds. And indeed, it is clear that the Antikythera shipwreck was a major discovery of new material from classical antiquity, which would go down in the history books even without the mechanism. By June of 1901, rumors and reports were beginning to appear of diminishing returns. The divers were still able to bring up small figurines and fragments, but major recoverable objects had already been found. The site was increasingly picked over. State supervisors, including the minister Stais, increasingly wanted to pull the plug on the mission and save any further expenses. But the divers insisted that they wanted to keep going. They believed that the smaller finds were still of value and that they had become more systematic in their approach, mapping out and scouring the seabed, much like archaeological excavators. On June 24th, as the operation was about to start winding down, the Greek newspaper Toasti published a telegram coming from one of the naval ships. And the report said, quote, There has been found one slab with an inscription whose letters, however, could not be copied. Besides these were found vases, fragments of sculptures, and other ancient objects. So it sounds from this brief report as if the excavators were starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel. But nonetheless, this reference to an inscribed so-called slab may actually be the first known reference in writing that has yet been found to the Antikythera mechanism. Another Greek paper called Scrip repeated a similar report, and they described this object as, quote, a marble slab bearing an inscription that is difficult to read. Now, this might just be an assumption, this notion that it was made of marble. This might have just been an assumption added into the report as journalists supposed that a large slab must have been made of marble. Or, alternatively, it may be that they had some oral source in the excavating operation who thought that it was marble because it seemed to be rectangular, hard, and white, and hence that stood to reason that it might have been the base or a plaque on some sculpture. However, according to a later story, which may or may not be true, but a story that was told in later years, in the summer of 1901, a naval crew member was loading the last finds from the excavation onto the naval ship Mikali, and he took this white slab, which seemed to him to be of very little value or interest, and he was ready to hurl it overboard in order to lighten the cargo. But before he did so, a naval officer named Pericles Rediatis stopped him, looked quickly over the object, and noticed a bit of metal projecting out of a fracture on its surface. And so he instructed the crew to keep it 
and pack it up with the other objects to be transported to the National Archaeological Museum. Now, regardless of whether this incident with Radiatus really happened, it was probably on this trip, as the objects were being unloaded in Athens, that the stone slab turned out to be neither stone nor a slab, because it crumbled apart into several fragments, four large ones and many small ones. And so the object revealed itself to be instead some sort of cluster of small bronze objects, which had been severely corroded and thickly crusted over with mineral accretions from sitting in the seawater for 2,000 years. A few months later, the salvage operation was ended in September 1901. And furthermore, the government for which Spiridon Stais had been serving as Minister of Education fell from power in November 1901. And the new government that replaced them never successfully worked out a plan or a deal to continue excavating the wreck site professionally. And in the following months, over the winter and spring of 1902, the National Archaeological Museum put together a team for the complex work of reassembling and reconstructing what seemed to be the major finds, most especially the Ephebe sculpture, which was dated to about Alexander the Great's time. The curators occasionally also looked through stone fragments in the debris, mainly looking for forms of bodies or clothing, which would indicate pieces of sculpture or statuary. But on May 6th, Spiridon Stais, having left office now as Minister of Education, went and visited the museum in order ostensibly to check up on the finds and the progress in conserving them. And he asked specifically to see the cache of unidentified fragments. And he noticed among them two especially large fragments that seemed to have broken off from the same object. One of them had a very faint inscription on it, and the other had on its surface two or more interlocking gears with pointed teeth around their rims. Within two days of this, papers excitedly reported a new find. For example, Toasti reported, quote, important discovery in the National Archaeological Museum, discovery of an inscribed bronze slab. Now you can see here, obviously, as often happens with this object, the journalists failed to realize the actual significance of what had been found, which was not so much the inscription or even the bronze material, but more so the gear work. But the archaeologists at the museum and the curators did know right away that this was critical. There are a number of surviving written references to geared machines, such as water clocks and pumps, musical organs, and decorative automata, surviving from the classical world. And a recent scholar actually has counted a total of 18 references in the known classical corpus. But up to this time, no remains of an actual specimen had ever been found. So the museum technicians then assembled a set of four large fragments that all evidently came from the same object in order to carefully examine, clean, and photograph them for possible identification. It became clear early on that they contained within them fragments of several gears of varying sizes, which had been enclosed between two thin bronze sheets, which in turn had inscriptions on them. The vast majority of these apparent texts were unreadable, due to fragmentation, corrosion, and heavy accretions, which were very difficult to clean off without obliterating the text underneath. But nonetheless, two phrases were pieced together, which proved to be very significant. One of them read, Ray of the Sun, in Greek, and the other read, Star of, which was then followed by the letters Alpha, Phi, Rho, which seemed as if they must surely be the beginning of the word Aphrodite. And the phrase Star of Aphrodite was the Roman era Greek name often used for the planet Venus. And so it seemed as if this geared machine or mechanism, whatever it was, must have an astronomical significance. So there followed after this discovery years of analysis and debate over exactly what the object was and how it functioned. The earliest supposition was that it was an astrolabe. And an astrolabe is a metal observational instrument which is held up to the eye in order to measure the positions in the sky of stars and constellations. 
and astrolabes are mainly used by navigators at sea in order to determine one's latitude and direction of travel. And they were very useful and especially important in the ancient and medieval world before the use of magnetic compasses, which could tell one's cardinal direction. And it also happens that there are some surviving specimens of astrolabes from the Islamic Golden Age and the European Middle Ages that include some small gear mechanisms for mechanically adjusting the instrument by the day or month of the calendar. And so it makes sense that a geared astrolabe might have been used on a large ship like the one that sank at Antikythera. A pair of Greek scholars published a book in 1903 in both Greek and German, which commented on the finds from the Antikythera hoard. And in this book, they argued that the mechanism was an astrolabe. And this became a widely held theory from that point right up until the 1950s. But also at the same time, this book attracted the attention of foreign, especially German, scholars, who included many archaeologists, historians, linguists, and so on. And also, in the meantime, the very careful, systematic cleaning and conservation of the fragments revealed more gears, with many widely varying sizes and numbers of teeth interlocking in a complex configuration. And so, with all of this buzz building, in the year 1905, a German philologist named Albert Rehm visited the museum in Athens and viewed the fragments of the mechanism. And he completely rejected the idea that it was an astrolabe for several reasons. One was simply the complexity of the mechanism, which was far beyond anything that seemed to have a purpose in an astrolabe. Also, the fact that the Sun and Venus who seem to be referred to in those recovered inscription texts, the Sun and Venus have nothing to do with an astrolabe, which one uses only at night and only in order to track the position of the stars and constellations in the firmament, or the, the dome of fixed stars. Also the fact that Rehm was able to decipher a few more lines of uncovered text, and these lines seemed to form elements in a so-called parapegma, and a parapegma is a kind of ancient document, often carved into tablets or wood boards, which lists off astronomical events over the course of a given month, such as conjunctions or first appearances of planets and constellations, and which the user then can track night by night by moving pegs along the board. And so for these reasons, Rehm soon gave lectures and published short articles arguing that the mechanism was not an astrolabe, but rather a planetarium or orrery. In other words, a gear-driven device designed to display the movements of the heavenly bodies, including the sun, moon, and planets, as they revolve around the Earth. Right. So an ancient pre-Copernican planetarium would have the Earth at the center and celestial bodies moving around it in various complex cycles. Or, alternatively, an orrery would simply be a machine or a display that showed the same motions but in a visually schematic way, say, for instance, by pointers moving around a dial. And this theory that the machine was a planetarium of some kind seemed to have some corroboration in written history. Specifically, the Roman philosopher Cicero, who lived in the first century BC, made in his writings three references to so-called sphaera, which seemed to be man-made spheres or globes that were intended to display the motions of the heavenly bodies. And one of these references in Cicero's writings is in the book De Republica, or Affairs of the Republic, and it occurs within a fictitious dialogue between two Roman consuls who had lived more than 100 years before Cicero's own time. And in this imagined dialogue, one of these consuls says that he has seen a sphaera made by the great craftsman Archimedes, which shows the sun and moon and the five wandering stars, or as we would call them planets, as they revolve around the earth at differing speeds and patterns, and recreating solar and lunar eclipses. So all in all, for these various reasons, Rehm's idea of the machine as being a planetarium gradually gained traction and won attention and favor, partly because it seems to connect the mysterious device to Archimedes, who is a celebrity figure associated both in the ancient world and today with many wondrous tales and creations. He's practically, of course, a household name. 
and of course because it seemed to account for the great complexity in the machine and its gear work. Now, nonetheless, I am going to spoil the fun and point out that over the ensuing years, both of these ideas, that the machine is a planetarium and that it is linked to Archimedes, have been gradually debunked. There simply are no spheres anywhere linked to the machine, and rather the gears clearly turned an array of different pointers on flat dials measuring time, space, and events. Also, the connection to Archimedes was always very tenuous and has been shown to rest on mistaken assumptions. But nonetheless, both ideas persist in popular culture and the media in various more convoluted or weaselly forms and simply refuse to die. For example, if one looks at the Wikipedia page on the Antikythera mechanism, it still says in the first line that the machine is an orrery, which again is basically a word for a two-dimensional planetarium, which represents the planetary motion schematically on a two-dimensional display. And it turns out that this uh, description is at best only partly true, because it only describes one of the machine's many features and only on one side. So as Susan Boyle might say, that's just one side of it. And as for the machine's origin and maker, the clues in the shipwreck and also the clues in the machine itself, including the writing styles used in the inscriptions and also the astronomical mathematics that are used in the gear work, show that it was definitely made in Greece by and for Greek speakers they show that it was almost certainly newly made when the ship went down, which was, as we know, more than 100 years after Archimedes had already died in Sicily. And yet still media commentators repeatedly claim that the machine was made in some way by, quote, the workshop of Archimedes, whatever that means. So all in all, this origin story connecting to Archimedes and the notion that it was primarily a planetarium or an orrery are clearly not true. Okay, so if that's the case, then what is it really, and where did it actually come from? Well, as for its origins and where it came from, the Antikythera ship's cargo was collected from all around the Aegean Basin, with various very high-value goods being obtained apparently in Miletus on the eastern shore of the Aegean, and also some in Rhodes, a large island at the far southeastern corner of the Aegean. Rhodes was known in classical antiquity as a center of learning, especially of astronomy, and it attracted scholars and astrologers from many countries all around, including one named Hipparchus, who was an astronomer originally from Anatolia, but who went to Rhodes in order to study there and made observations there in the 100s BC, including discovering the so-called precession of the equinoxes, which is the phenomenon by which the sun, at each repeating point in the solar year, such as the equinoxes, moves slightly eastward year by year, as measured against the fixed stars in the firmament. And hence this leads the solar year and the zodiac signs to go slightly out of phase over the course of thousands of years. So this is a phenomenon that was discovered and discerned by Hipparchus on Rhodes, and that at that time was not considered significant enough to have to factor into astrological calculations. But today it does have some effect. You might notice that our months are a bit out of phase with the zodiac signs. Another prominent astronomer at Rhodes who came just after Hipparchus was named Posidonius, who was from Syria. And Posidonius was known to have estimated the diameter of the Earth based on astronomical observations and to have studied the effects of the moon on the cycles of the tides. So Cicero, that Roman philosopher we already mentioned before, in another passage in his book called On the Nature of the Gods, Cicero says that Posidonius had also made a sphera, which mimics the movements of the sun, moon, and planets, quote, for each day and night. Now, if we take that to mean that Posidonius was able to illustrate the different motions of the celestial bodies day by day or night by night, then this sphera that Cicero is referring to is actually closer to the Antikythera mechanism because it not only displays the motions of the bodies, but tracks them by date through the year. Furthermore, Posidonius died reportedly in 51 BC, and hence the Antikythera shipwreck almost surely happened within his lifetime. So hence, for all of these reasons, the current best guess 
as to the origins of the machine is that it was made in Rhodes, probably by an atelier of skilled craftsmen and astronomers. We don't know specifically who they were, but if we had to pick a single known individual as a possible designer, the best candidate would be Posidonius. And it was likely commissioned by a buyer somewhere else in the Greek-speaking world, but who lived to the west of the Aegean, which is clearly where the ship was headed at the time when it sank at Antikythera. And so a prime area to look would be somewhere on the western coast of Greece. The current theory put forward by the scholar Alexander Jones in his 2017 book called A Portable Cosmos is that the patron who commissioned the machine lived in the region of Epirus in the far northwestern corner of Greece and that the ship was planning to stop there to offload some valuable cargo, including the machine, before then continuing on to Italy and probably the port of Ostia for the goods to be shipped to Rome. But in order to know the full reason why this is likely the case, specifically that the buyer of the mechanism was in Epirus, we then have to discuss the actual design, features, and function of the machine. Okay, so to look at the nature of the machine itself, as of the 1940s, the main two competing interpretations were that it was an astrolabe or a planetarium. During the Second World War, all research on the machine had to be halted. Curators packed up all of the small artifacts of the museum into boxes, including simple wooden or cigar boxes, and then locked them in underground rooms beneath the museum, which were then filled up with sand in order to protect them from the impacts of bombs and from Nazi looting. After the war was over, when they were dug up and unpacked, it was found that some pieces of the mechanism had further broken or had been misplaced. Nonetheless, in the 1950s, a British scholar named Derek de Soya Price again began trying to examine and assemble the various pieces. And he rejected both of these ideas, that it was an astrolabe or a planetarium. And he drew on new observations and analysis of the gearwork inside the machine, which are very complex and involve interlocking gears with ratios of teeth similar to the ratios between the revolutions of heavenly bodies, such as the ratio between the complete lunar month, which is about 29.53 days, and the solar year, which was understood in the ancient world as 365.25 days. He also further pointed to new short scraps of text that curators at the National Archaeological Museum had been able to piece together from fragments, and which dealt with months and years, and seemed at points to describe eclipses, not just planetary motions. So he argued, beginning in lectures and articles in 1959, that the machine was not merely a planetarium or an orrery, but rather a multifaceted calendar computing machine, in effect the earliest known analog computer. And Price used current data and observations to argue that the machine was a simple rectangular box with front and back faces. And he pointed to the largest gear, which is more than five inches in diameter, and is visible embedded in the largest fragment, called Fragment A. This gear has 223 teeth, and he argued that this gear was used to represent the basic cycle of the solar year. And it would have been turned by a manual input, such as a knob or crank, set into the side of the machine, and it in turn would drive various other gears, some of them interlocking by the teeth along the rim of the large gear, and some of them turning on axles or arbors that were then affixed into various holes drilled into various points or within the gear. So while there is, you could say, a sort of master gear turning all the rest of the machine, the different trains of gears branching off from that larger gear would all turn by different patterns and ratios. And these branching gear trains in turn would drive pointers on both sides of the machine tracking calendrical dates and aligning them with celestial events. So Price was able to persuade the National Archaeological Museum to further allow microwave and x-ray scans of the various fragments in order to begin to reconstruct these hidden gear trains. The results largely bore out Price's theory and added some further details. He summed up his complete theory in a book called Gears from the Greeks, published in 1974. And he argued that the machine had at least 27 gears and dealt with long multi-year astronomical and calendrical cycles. 
This book was controversial, and it had several large gaps filled in by speculation. But nonetheless, it certainly made a strong case that the mechanism was by far the most complex and fine-tuned piece of technology ever found from the ancient world. And also, Price over the years published articles in popular outlets such as Nature, uh, one of them at the insistence of Arthur C. Clarke, who learned about and became interested in the mechanism and had Price publish in wide circulation English language media. So over the next 40 years, as optical and x-ray scanning technology has improved decade by decade, new examinations have been carried out periodically. In the early 1990s, there was an, an analysis overseen by Michael T. Wright, which found that there were at least 31 gears, and they included trains that branched off from the main solar cycle gear to drive pointers simulating the paths of the planets through the zodiac. And they also included, as it happens, in the base of the pointer representing the motions of the moon, there was also an embedded rotating ball that was painted half black and half white, and that would turn within its chamber to represent the moon's phases as the moon moved around the dial. These pointers all revolved around a main front dial, which could therefore be called an orrery. Far, that theory seems to be true. However, there are also other branching gear trains leading to other dials on the opposite face of the machine, all of which then moved in tandem, driven by the one hand input on the side of the machine. Then again in the early 2000s, a scientific team, including the scholars Tony Freeth and Alexander Jones, called the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project, did another round of scans, including on several broken, smaller, and corroded fragments that Greek curators had been able to locate and collect in the vaults. The team was able to create digital files with three-dimensional models of the fragments, which could then be fitted together like a 3D jigsaw puzzle. They also commissioned chemical analyses on the metals and found that it was made mostly of high copper bronze with a small addition of tin and also some pewter-like alloys of mostly tin. And they were able to use tomography scans in order to gain clearer views of the text that had been obscured within the fragments. All in all, the AMRP team was able to settle upon a detailed, precise reconstruction of the machine including its structure, its visible features, and its operation. So I will now try to give a basic description of the machine as it would have appeared and functioned for an operator when it was intact. And then afterwards I will try to briefly discuss why it looked the way that it did and what functions it must have served. So just to describe how it actually looked. It was a rectangular box which stood upright on its end. The top, bottom, and left and right sides were all made of wood. The front and back faces of the machine were thin bronze plates, which show several circular or spiral-shaped dials, and which were engraved with numbers and texts in Greek in the negative spaces around the dials. The machine was driven by a small round knob, or possibly a crank, set into the side. When it lay upon the sea floor, there were also two further bronze plates covered in inscriptions lying over the front and back faces of the machine, although it is unknown how they were attached to the machine itself, possibly by hinges, allowing them to be opened outward like doors. Inside the machine were 35 moving and interlocking gears in various configurations, all but one of which have been found to survive, at least in some small fragment, among the pieces of the machine recovered from the wreck. Now, before giving further details, it may be the right moment now to stop and define a few terms that I've been using. For one, train or gear train. This is a series of gears that all turn together in tandem to drive some single endpoint, and trains can branch off from one another, leading to different endpoints. A dial is a complete display that shows some variable measurement. In the analog age, dials were generally round, either circular, semicircular, or spiral shaped. For example, an analog clock or a barometer is a dial. A scale is a specific part of a dial. Namely, it is the band of graduated markings running around the rim of the dial, 
showing the specific units of measure, whether those are units of time, weight, pressure, etc. For example, the numbers around the rim of an analog clock are the scale. Then the pointer. The pointer is a long object that pivots around the center point of the dial and indicates points on the scale. For example, the hands of a clock are pointers. So, with those definitions in mind, the Antikythera mechanism had a total of six dials, one on the so-called front face and five others on the back. All of these dials' pointers would turn simultaneously, but at differing speeds, whenever the input knob was turned. Okay, so what were these dials, and what did they track? Well, let's begin with the upper back side of the machine, where there was a complex of three connected dials. The large one occupying most of the upper space of the back face of the machine was the so-called metonic dial, which is arguably the most important because it was the key to tracking all of the others. The scale of the metonic dial was a groove cut through the bronze plate, which spirals around the center of the dial five times. All along this spiral, the groove is marked out into small sections, 235 of them in number, and each one marked with Greek names of the months in a repeating cycle. And they seem to be the names of months from a version of the Corinthian calendar, first developed in the Greek city of Corinth. These 235 months were also grouped together into blocks of 12 or 13. Each of these blocks was numbered from 1 to 19. And apparently these blocks represent each one year in the Corinthian calendar. And so all in all, in the metonic dial, or in the scale of the metonic dial, there were a total of 19 years subdivided into 235 lunar months, which constitute a cyclically repeating cycle traced out by the pointer. So what was the pointer? The pointer was a long straight rod set into the central pivot point of the dial with ball bearings so that it could slide back and forth as it moved around the spiral, giving it a variable length. On the end of the pointer was a needle-like pin that projected down and slotted into the groove so that it could slide around the spiral as it turned, much like the needle of a record player slides over a vinyl record on a turntable. Evidently, the pin would slide outward along the spiral until it reached the outer end of the spiral, at which point it would have to be lifted out and slid back into the beginning point of the spiral. So that's the basic description of the large metonic dial. Now, within the circular negative space inside the metonic dial, there were set two much smaller circular dials, called the Games or Olympiad dial and the Calypic dial. So to begin with the Games dial, this was a small circular dial divided into four quadrants, which were numbered from one to four. And they were also labeled around the outer rim of the scale with the names of six different Greek sporting tournaments that were regularly held in a repeating cycle of every four years. And it starts with the Olympics, the most famous and prestigious of the tournaments, which is labeled next to section number one, representing the first year in the repeating Olympiad period. And then it continues on with the Isthmian Games, which were held in years one and three, the Nemean Games held in years two and four, the Naya held in year two, the Pythians held in year three, and the Halieia held in year four. So the Metonic Dial and the Games Dial were in sync such that when the metonic pointer advanced by one year in the 19-year cycle, the games dial also advanced one year in its four-year cycle. Both of them, and all other dials on the machine, were all driven by the one input knob on the side, and it seems that each full turn of the knob advanced the dials by about 78 days, or in other words, it took about 4.7 complete turns of the knob in order to advance the dials by one year. Okay, so we have the metonic dial, then one of the smaller dials set within it, 
is the Olympiad dial. The other is the Callipic dial, another very small circular dial, which has not actually been recovered. But nonetheless, we are able to reconstruct fairly confidently how it worked and even how it looked based on the gear train that drove it. This dial was also divided into four sections, much like the game style, but it turned much slower, advancing only by one section each time the metonic dial made a full revolution all the way around the complete 19-year spiral. Thus, a complete revolution around the Calypic dial represented a repeating cycle of 76 years in total. Okay, so then obviously the question is, what is the point of this upper back complex of dials? And it seems the answer is that they made it possible, as the machine is operated, to keep track of the precise date that you are analyzing in the Corinthian calendar, a calendar which was used in several parts of Greece in the Hellenistic and Roman eras, and which happened to be well suited for precise astronomical calculations. So why is that and how so? Well, in order to understand that, we have to talk about ancient calendars. So in the pre-modern world, different civilizations, kingdoms, and even cities used their own distinctive calendars, often developed in different ways according to the seasons or according to the beliefs about the gods or the cosmos that were held by people in that particular place. Some calendars were simply based on observing astronomical events like solstices or phases of the moon as they happened, and then declaring a new year or a new month on the spot. For instance, when the sun starts moving back down in the sky, or when a new crescent moon appears at the beginning of a month. However, some peoples wanted more precision and predictability, and they tried to calculate and forecast celestial events into the future so that actions like sowing or harvesting, or civic events like elections, coronations, festivals, and sacrifices could be timed in advance in sync with these celestial events. These pre-calculated calendars could be very precise, trying to stay perfectly in sync with the cycles of the heavens, or they could be more rough, just allowing for some degree of imprecision or drift of dates from year to year or month to month. Also, another dimension of variation was that these calendars could be either solar, based only on tracking the motions of the sun, or they could be lunisolar, trying to align dates with the cycles of both the sun and the moon. Now, just as an example for reference, our modern day calendar, the Julian calendar, is unusual in that it is very precise, but it is only solar, not lunisolar. So, in other words, we create very complex continuing cycles of leap years with leap days and even leap seconds in order to keep our calendar perfectly aligned with the cycles of the solar year. And so solstices and equinoxes always occur in the same basic date ranges of the year for centuries or even millennia far into the future. But on the other hand, we don't really give a damn about the phases of the moon. Now, you may or may not be aware, the actual lunar month running from one complete full moon to another or one perfect new moon to another is about 29.53 days in length. And this does not divide evenly into the 365-day year. But in order to get around this inconvenience, we simply decided several centuries ago that we didn't really care. And so we just chopped the year into 12 so-called months of varying irregular lengths from 28 to 31 days that have no actual relation to the moon. And we just said good enough. And we just happen to still use this sort of vestigial term month for these arbitrarily drawn sections of the year, even though they do not correspond at all to the actual motions or phases of the moon. Now, as I said, this system is pretty unusual. Generally, when we look back into the ancient world, when, when there were many different calendars around, things tended to shake out differently. So some societies saw the heavenly bodies as extremely important and they wanted to time all of their activities together with the motions of the heavens, and they created obsessively precise calendars that were almost always lunisolar. In other words, they tried somehow to reconcile the different cycles of the sun and moon, and they sought ways to begin each year 
with the same phase of the moon. So in other words, what they would most often do was they would track the beginning of each month, starting with the new moon, which was understood as the division point. So a, uh, properly speaking, a given month would end with the new moon when the moon was invisible. And then the next month would be declared to start when the first sliver of crescent appeared in the sky. And so lunisolar calendars would try to take this appearance of a moon for the first time as the beginning point both of a new month and of a new year. So they didn't like beginning a new year in the middle or in some arbitrary moment in the course of a month and splitting that month between this year and the next year. They wanted to align months and years. Okay, so how would one do that? Well, one could do that in one of two ways, either by observing the precise motions of the sun and moon over many years and accumulating these data in order to see how long it takes for the same phase of the moon, usually the new moon, to occur upon the exact same day of the solar year twice, hence completing a repeating cycle in which the out-of-phase lunar and solar cycles would come back into alignment. Or, if they were up for it, they could do so by measuring the exact length in days of a true lunar month and the exact length in days of a solar year, and then calculating the lowest common multiple of those two numbers so that you can then know how many years it will take for the new moon to again occur upon the exact same day. And that gives you a cycle of X number of years, some of which in that cycle you will then round off to 12 months, and some of which will have to be 13 months. So in order to get the years and the months into phase, one has to have a variable length year, where most will be 12 months, but some will have an extra or so-called intercalary 13th month added in. So the first civilization that cared enough to do this and to create a lunar-solar calendar of this degree of precision was, of course, Babylonia. So the Babylonians, as I discussed earlier in my lecture on astrology, which I will uh, link to in the description, the Babylonians were really the first civilization that tried to obsessively track celestial events and orchestrate human events in alignment with them. The Babylonians saw the night sky as basically a canvas upon which were written divine messages influencing or presaging events on Earth. They were obsessive enough to try to observe and catalog the exact solar dates of lunar phases and events. And they found that the solar and lunar cycles, which were out of phase, nonetheless came almost perfectly back into sync in a repeating cycle every 19 years. In other words, 235 lunar months are almost exactly the same length as 19 solar years. And so each of these 19 years in this repeating cycle can then be started off from the first new moon that appears or fails to appear after a given solar event, such as, say, the winter solstice. And using this method, most years will comprise 12 months, but occasionally some will have to have 13 months. Namely, out of the 19 years in this cycle, six of them, specifically the 3rd, the 6th, the 9th, the 11th, the 14th, and the 17th, will be longer and will have an extra month added in. And the Babylonians achieved this by simply taking some month of the year and doubling it, either the month of Ululu or the month of Adaru. And that is how they would round out this cycle to align with the moon. Now, this system should sound eerily familiar to many of my Jewish listeners because it happens that the Hebrew calendar, which is used for the Jewish liturgical year and festival cycle, this Hebrew calendar is based fairly closely on the Babylonian calendar. And it rounds out these intercalary years by adding in an extra month of Elul or Adar, just like the Babylonians would double Ululu or Adaru. So in the ancient world, at least up until the 400s BC, the knowledge of this precise celestial cycle and the calendar based upon it remained contained only in Babylonia. But in the Hellenistic Age and the 300s and 200s BC, it started to spread and be shared, especially among astronomers and astrologers all around the Hellenistic world. 
Now, meanwhile, at the same time, Greek astronomers, starting in the 400s BC, also started independently attempting more precise observations, like those that had been going on for several hundred years already in Babylonia. And specifically, an Athenian astronomer named Meton made the same discovery that the Babylonians had made of the 19-year lunisolar cycle, and hence this cycle came to be called in Greek the Metonic cycle. And this was very useful, but nonetheless, it has certain drawbacks. What are the drawbacks of this so-called Metonic lunisolar cycle? Well, for one thing, it does not yield a complete whole number of days. Because 19 solar years are actually about 6,939 and three quarters days, hence, if one follows a calendar based strictly on the Metonic cycle, it will still go slowly out of phase with the sun and the moon over the course of centuries, because you're leaving off a fraction of a day. And so, therefore, another astronomer who followed after Meton, who was named Callippus, proposed fixing this tiny imprecision. By dropping one day out of one year in every fourth metonic cycle, in effect, this would multiply the metonic cycle times four, making it into a longer, complete 76-year cycle, which would have a complete whole number of years, months, and days. In other words, in one complete calipic cycle, which is four metonic cycles, there are 76 solar years, 940 lunar months. Or 27,759 days, and as I mentioned, this newer, longer, complete cycle was called the Callipic. So this Callipic cycle was adopted as the basis for astronomical forecasts by some astronomers around the Hellenistic world, and then also was adopted into the new reformed version of the calendar of the city of Corinth. And from there, it also then spread to other towns and cities where there was Corinthian influence. And as it did so, sometimes the names of the, of the months would be changed in order to match the local gods or festivals in those different towns and cities. Nonetheless, this basic Corinthian calendar, based on the Metonic and Callipic cycles, is what appears in the upper back dials of the Antikythera mechanism. The cycle of 19 years and 235 lunar months is tracked in the Metonic dial. The longer Callipic cycle is tracked by the Callipic dial, which keeps track of which of the four Metonic cycles you are in. And hence, because it does so, the Callipic dial tracks how many years you have to add on to the date seen on the Metonic cycle, in order to pinpoint the actual year date that the machine is displaying. Hence. Its sections were probably marked. The four sections of the Callipic dial were almost surely marked: blank, nineteen, thirty-eight, and fifty-seven. So those are the number of years zero, nineteen, thirty-eight, and fifty-seven that you have to add on to the year number seen in the Metonic dial in order to get the actual current year in the longer Callipic cycle. Okay, so if that is what the Metonic and Callipic dials do, they tell you the precise month and year that the machine is set to in the Callipic cycle. Then what about the games dial? Well, the games dial might have been included there for various reasons. Now, the games dial early on had been unknown to scholars like Price or Albert Ream. It was discovered in the 2000s, and Some of you might remember when this information was shared with the media, various reporters declared in big headlines, "The Antikythera mechanism was used to predict the Olympic Games." Well, this obviously is wrong and makes no sense. And as Alexander Jones points out in *A Portable Cosmos*, this is clearly ridiculous. The Greeks didn't need a complex computing machine to just count to four. Everyone knew when the games were going to occur. So the dial had to be there for some other reason, because it somehow complemented the other data and information on the other dials. Now Jones doesn't really, as far as I can tell, explain or speculate as to why the games dial was there. But I would speculate or theorize several possible reasons. One of them is that it may have been in order to know whether special, meaningful astronomical events. Were going to happen around the time of the different games, and the games very well might have involved a lot of predictions and betting 
and hence some users might have wanted to make astrological predictions and forecasts before the various games were held. Or, even more likely, I would say that the game's dial served as a convenient way of making sure that the user had not lost their place in time as they advanced the machine, and a way to ensure that the machine was set to the current year or to a particular recent or upcoming year, if that is what the user was interested in, because anyone in Greece would know whether the big repeating public events, like the Olympics, had just happened or were about to happen. And more specifically, the four-year cycle of the Olympiad could be used as an easy check to make sure that the machine was set to the correct metonic segment of the four-part calypic cycle. If the dial is not pointed to the right set of games for the year that you're trying to analyze, then you know that you're in the wrong metonic cycle, and you have to turn backwards or forwards until the game's dial is in the correct alignment. Now also, additionally, something Jones does point out in A Portable Cosmos is that the metonic and the game's dials happen to provide further confirmation that the machine was very likely made in Rhodes for a patron in Epirus. Now why is that? The exact calendar of the metonic dial is the Corinthian calendar, which was invented in Corinth. But the month names on the scale of the metonic dial do not all exactly match those that were used in Corinth. And also, if the buyer was in Corinth, there was no reason for the machine to have been carried on a large merchant ship passing by Antikythera on its way to the west. It would have simply been brought a few miles down the road to Corinth. However, the Corinthian calendar, as I mentioned before, was also adopted in other places. And these include the Corinthian colonies in Sicily, such as Syracuse and Taormina, and also in Epirus, in northwestern Greece, which was under Corinthian domination and influence. So over the years, some have theorized that the machine was bound for Sicily, where the user might have been in Syracuse or Taormina. But surviving documents that have been recovered in Sicily show that five out of the 12 month names used in those calendars in Sicily do not match those on the machine. On the other hand, when it comes to Epirus, no complete calendar from Epirus has ever been found, but there are documents referring to holidays and events in Epirus which show that two of the month names that were used in that calendar there match those that are distinct to the Antikythera mechanism, again further suggesting a likely connection between the machine and Epirus. And also, as I mentioned, Epirus is on the northwestern coast and could easily have been a stopover on the way for the ship's voyage from Greece to Rome. Now another further clue is on the game's dial. So most of the Panhellenic games that are listed around the game's dial were large and prestigious tournaments. By contrast, the two smallest and least known of these tournaments to appear on the machine were the Naya and the Haliaea. The Naya took place in Epirus, further underscoring the likelihood that the machine was made for a patron in Epirus, while the Haliaea, for its part, took place in Rhodes, providing one more clue bolstering the connection to Rhodes. So all in all, the upper back dials keep track of exact dates according to a highly precise and refined lunisolar calendar, probably as it was known and used among astronomers and astrologers in Epirus. Now, next, we tilt our head downward and look down at the lower back complex of dials. These are namely two dials, the Saros and the Exeligmos dials. So firstly, the Saros dial is another very large spiral dial designed very similarly to the metonic dial. It has a large spiraling groove and a pointer of variable length and a needle that slides along the groove. But the groove of this dial makes only four complete turns rather than five. And the scale was divided up into only 223 sections rather than 235. And these 223 segments apparently also represented lunar months, like on the metonic scale. But the months here are not named, nor are they grouped together into years. Instead, most of them are left completely blank, while others, it seems 51 of them, 
had little symbols or glyphs in them denoting different lunar or solar eclipses. And they also, it seems, had number markings that connected then to a key inscribed along the sides of the back plate. And in this key, one could find further detailed information about these forecast eclipses, such as the hour of the day or night when they were forecast to happen, the zodiacal sign marking the part of the sky in which they would be visible, and even the duration and intensity of the eclipse, and in some cases, even the color, such as red or yellow or black. So these were extremely detailed and precise forecasts of eclipses as distributed in what appears to be a repeating 223-month cycle. Okay, so that is the Sauros dial. Now, again, a smaller dial set within it, just like the games and Calypic dials are set inside the Metonic dial, Set within the Sauros dial, there was an Exaligmos dial. So this is another very small dial, which was divided in this case into three parts, marked with numbers, one of them blank, one marked 8, and one marked 16. And much like the Calypic dial, the Exaligmos dial would advance by one section, one of its three sections, each time that the Sauros dial made a complete revolution around the whole spiral. Okay. So these lower back dials clearly track a different cycle, which is slightly shorter than the metonic cycle. So whereas the upper dials clearly track the metonic, the repeating metonic cycle, which four times adds up to a calypic cycle, the lower back dial tracks a 223 cycle, which repeats three times in a longer so-called exaligmos cycle. And these cycles were used to forecast eclipses with remarkable detail and precision, not only when they might occur, but even how they would look. Okay, so in order to understand why the lower back dials were so important and so detailed, we have to understand certain things about eclipses, how they occur and how they repeat. And this is extremely complicated. I'm going to try to give a limited summary here. This is where I am off notes, going off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> to try to explain why these dials were so important. Okay, so an eclipse, as we understand an eclipse today, is a moment where the sun, the earth, and the moon come into perfect linear alignment. And if the moon at that moment is located between the earth and the sun, it casts a shadow onto part of the earth. And if you happen to be where that shadow is cast, of course, you see the moon obscuring the sun. A lunar eclipse is basically the same occurrence where the moon is on the other side of the earth, and hence the shadow of the earth is cast onto the moon. Now, one might naturally ask, as I did when I was a young kid, I wondered, why don't eclipses simply happen every single month? Every time there's a full moon, shouldn't the moon be back behind the earth in the shadow of the earth? And whenever there is a new moon, the moon is in the same place in the sky as the sun. Why isn't it blocking the sun? Now, if you are reasonably well informed or not a fool, you might know that's because the revolutions of the moon around the earth and the revolutions of the earth around the sun are not perfectly lined up. As the earth revolves around the sun, we move in what's called the plane of our orbit. There, You can imagine a sort of flat disk surrounding the sun, and we are always orbiting within that disk. If you were to then look at the revolutions of the moon around the Earth, it also has a plane within which it orbits the Earth, and it's not perfectly aligned with the orbit of the Earth around the sun. It's tilted by about five degrees. So what that means is that most times that the moon passes, say, between the Earth and the sun, it's not actually perfectly between the two. It's off kilter. It's a bit to the north or a bit to the south. And hence the shadow of the moon misses the earth most of the time. And likewise, when the moon passes around behind the earth on the other side, it's usually passing just above or below, or more strictly speaking, north or south of the earth. And so it misses the earth's shadow. It's only on occasions that it happens that the moon, as it passes 
between the Earth and the Sun, it happens to cut right directly through the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, and hence it moves right into that exact position, at least for a brief time, for a few hours. It moves into that exact position where it casts its shadow, its darkest shadow, or the umbra, onto some point on the Earth. And likewise, when it's passing around the other way, it's only every once in a while that it passes right through the plane of the Earth's revolutions around the sun, and hence it hits the Earth's shadow again for maybe a few minutes or a few hours. Okay, so those are the absolute basics, right? Now, there are several implications to this. One is that solar and lunar eclipses are highly irregular. They occur when the alignment happens to be just right, which happens according to very variable and complicated repeating patterns. And that is because not only is it true that the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth is a bit tilted and off kilter compared to the Earth's plane of orbit around the sun, but also both of these orbits are themselves very irregular. So the Earth is not moving around the sun in a perfect circle. It's an ellipse. So some moments we're closer to the sun, sometimes a bit farther away. And when we're closer to the sun, we're revolving a bit faster. Our orbit speeds up. And we're far when we're farther away, it slows down. And likewise with the moon's revolutions around the Earth. The moon's revolutions are also slightly off kilter. There are points where the moon is farther away from the Earth and points when it's closer. And even beyond that, there are further irregularities and complications in the moon's orbit, because as the moon is revolving around the Earth, it's also being pulled by the gravity of the sun, and that causes what are called perturbations. So the, there's even a greater wobbliness and irregularity as the moon goes around the Earth. So what this means is that the fact that one eclipse happens at a certain moment of the month or the year doesn't mean you're therefore going to know when it's going to happen again. It is highly complex. There are so many factors at play that it is in effect unpredictable when an eclipse is going to happen. So if you were in the ancient world, the only things you could do in order to try to figure out how and when and why eclipses happen is by carefully observing them and tracking when they happen and seeing if they somehow repeat. Okay, now the Babylonians, again, they were the one people in the world who cared enough about eclipses that they would obsessively watch the sky until one happened. And for hundreds of years, they just did this over and over again and meticulously noted down everything about the eclipse in cuneiform tablets, which were then accumulated and collected in Babylon and other cities. They had to be truly obsessed with it, and furthermore, they had to have the wealth, the power, and the continuing political stability to constantly have a staff of astronomers meticulously watching the sky every day and night and noting down the time, the date, and the details of every eclipse that they saw. This was an enormous undertaking that had to be sustained over centuries in order to come up with the data by which they could describe the repeating cycles of eclipses. And not only did they note down an eclipse, a lunar or solar eclipse, happened at a certain moment of a certain night of a certain year, but they also noted how long did it last? What did it look like? Was the moon completely darkened or only in part? Did it look red or yellow? Or for a solar eclipse, was the sun completely covered or only partially covered? Was some of it visible uh, in the north or on the south side? How long did the obscuration last? And so on and so on. So the Babylonians quickly recognized something. Or, well, I should say, very slowly, over centuries, they recognized something. They recognized that not all eclipses are created alike. Every eclipse has its own sort of flavor. And if you note down enough details, you can categorize eclipses according to these different sort of flavors. And what they found after centuries of accumulating these data, they found that if a certain eclipse happens and it has a certain character, right, it's, let's say, a total lunar eclipse that lasts for 30 minutes, just for example, that exact same flavor of eclipse is going to happen again more or less precisely 
18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours later. So what this means, at, to translate that into modern astronomical terms, what that means is that when a particular eclipse happens, the moon in, is in a certain position in relation to the Earth, it has a certain trajectory of motion in relation to the Earth, it's in a particular moment of its complicated cyclical orbit pattern, and then it's going to pass out of that position, but it's going to come back into that exact position again and pass through the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun at the exact right moment again, 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours later. Now, that's not exactly precise. There actually is a little variation there where it can be more like 6 hours or more like 9 hours. So it's not exact to the very same hour. But it is close enough that the Babylonians observed this repeating period where the same eclipse would come back every 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours, reliably enough that they could use that to forecast eclipses centuries into the future and be reasonably confident that those same eclipses were going to come back again in that repeating cycle. And this period of 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours is what astronomers came to call the Saros. So you can use this Saros as a unit of time to predict when a particular eclipse of a particular appearance and character is going to come back repeatedly. And you can use it to predict eclipses at least down to the day, if not to the specific time of day. So if one looks at the Saros dial, what one sees is a section of 223 lunar months, which is the same as 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours, right? That it is, it is simply this repeating cycle that every 223 times the moon revolves around the Earth, it's going to do the same eclipse again, whether that is a particular lunar eclipse or a particular solar eclipse. And the Babylonians and apparently the Greek astronomers, based on the evidence of the Antikythera mechanism, these Greek astronomers in Rhodes or other places in Greece knew about this Saros cycle, and they were able to catalog and date and forecast lunar eclipses with a great degree of confidence. They knew precisely when a lunar eclipse was going to happen, or when various particular lunar eclipses were going to happen over the course of a given Saros. And it was usually 40 or 41 lunar eclipses if you really were meticulous about viewing even, even minor partial eclipses. Solar eclipses are a different kettle of fish, okay? So a lunar eclipse can be easier to forecast because it's easier to observe. If a lunar eclipse happens, everyone who's on the nighttime side of the Earth is going to be able to see it, right? It's visible to everybody on that whole hemisphere of the Earth. As long as you're in nighttime, it's a moment of full moon. The moon is going to be above the horizon. As long as you can peek over the trees or the rooftops or whatever and see the moon, you're going to see the lunar eclipse. So basically every lunar eclipse is going to be visible to half the Earth. Okay, which means that any time a given lunar eclipse happens, there's a 50-50 shot that wherever you happen to be standing, you're going to be able to see it. Fairly simple. Solar eclipses, of course, are different. With a solar eclipse, the moon only casts its shadow on part of the Earth. So any given time that a solar eclipse happens, and there are equal numbers of lunar and solar eclipses, they're equally frequent. Any given person on the Earth is only going to see a small fraction of the solar eclipses because there's only a small percentage of chance that you're going to happen to be in that spot on the Earth where the shadow will be cast and will you, you will see the moon obscuring the sun. So what that means is ancient astronomers, as they were studying these cycles in the Saros, they found that there were certain dates and times when they could be certain that they would see lunar eclipses as long as they were in nighttime, whereas solar eclipses, by comparison, were harder to predict. And they knew that there were certain times when solar eclipses were liable to happen, particularly just in, within the same month as a lunar eclipse, right? Just 14 days earlier or 14 days after, or five months or six months before or after a lunar eclipse. 
those are dates when you're liable to possibly see a solar eclipse, but sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. And the geometry and the astronomy was just too complex, too convoluted to be able to predict precisely the way we can today, where exactly is a solar eclipse going to be seen when it does occur? And if you are in a given spot on the Earth, like say Corinth, are you going to see a particular solar eclipse on a particular day? So it seems that what one sees when one looks on the Saros dial on the Antikythera mechanism is you see the months of the Saros, the 223 months laid out in order, and you see markings showing when one can confidently expect that a lunar eclipse is going to occur and you will see it if you are in nighttime at that moment. And there are markings showing where there is a possibility that a solar eclipse might occur as well. And there is at least some chance you might see it. But they knew that with any given solar eclipse date in the Saros, there was only a small fraction of possibility that it was actually going to be visible to you. They understood the geometry very differently, right? They continued with the assumption that the Earth was at the center and that the sun and moon were revolving around the Earth. But that geometry was perfectly adequate in order to account for and describe the motions that lead to eclipses. They just thought the sun and the moon are revolving around the Earth in slightly different planes of orbit. They only occasionally come into alignment. And if they do, if it leads to a lunar eclipse, it will be visible to that whole half of the Earth that faces towards the moon. And if there is a solar eclipse, it just happens that most people are not going to be in exactly the right spot on the Earth in order to witness it. So while their cosmic geometry was different, it was still perfectly adequate to grasp how these motions worked and why the calculations of eclipses through the Saros worked. Okay, so let's say that basically, if I have explained this well enough, that basically tells us why it is that the Saros style looks the way it does and has the information that it does. But maybe you've noticed that again with the Saros, as with the metonic cycle, there's a problem, which is that the Saros does not calculate out to an exact whole number of days. Right? There's about a third of a day, eight hours, left in the length of a Saros. And what that means is that, say you observe a particular eclipse, at some point in the Saros cycle. And you say there was a lunar eclipse that only covered the northern half of the moon and it lasted two hours. You can be sure that another eclipse of the same kind is going to happen again 18 years, 11 days, and about eight hours later. But what if this eclipse, the first one that you observe, happened very late at night, like 4 a.m.? Well, that means that the next time that same eclipse comes around, it's going to happen eight hours later in the day, which is noon. At noontime, it's invisible to you. So actually, the Saros cycle is not so good for predicting eclipses because about half the time, the next eclipse that you forecast is going to happen at the wrong time of day and it'll be invisible. Right? Either it'll be a lunar eclipse that happens during the day, so it's out of your view, or a solar eclipse that occurs while you're in nighttime, so you can't see it. So really, a more useful unit of measure, if you want to predict eclipses precisely, to know when in the day they're going to happen, and to know that they're going to be visible or not visible, a more precise calculation is to use three Sarosses. So if you say, okay, right now I'm seeing an eclipse and it's happening at 11 p.m. Three Saros cycles from now, that same eclipse will happen again at the same time of night and will again be visible to me in the same way and in the same part of the sky. So that complete loop of three Sarosses, in other words, a cyclic period of exactly 54 years and 34 days, in which eclipses are going to recur not only in the same way but also at the same time of day or night and hence be definitely visible or not visible that three that set of three sarosses is called an exaligmos which means in greek the turn of the wheel so this was a complete turn of the wheel in which the exact same eclipses would occur again 
at the same time. So that's why the Saros cycle has set within it the smaller Exaligma style, which tracks which Saros you are in in a repeating Exaligma cycle. And that is why it was marked with these numbers 8, 16, and blank. So if you are turning your knob and you're watching the pointer move through the Saros from month to month, pointing towards different eclipses, and the Exaligma style is pointing to blank, that means that the times, the hours, that you're reading off from the Saros style are perfect exactly as they are, and you don't have to add or subtract anything to them. So if the Saros style says in this month that you're getting to, there's going to be an eclipse at 4 p.m., you know 4 p.m. is the right time. If the exaligma style is pointing to the next section that says 8, that means you have to add 8 hours onto all of the times that are listed in the Saros style. Add 8 hours, and then you have your roughly correct time when you should expect to see an eclipse on some night of that month. And likewise, of course, if the pointer in the exaligma style is on the third section that says 16, you have to add 16 hours. So together, the Saros style and the exaligma style tell you when you can expect a particular kind of lunar or solar eclipse to happen, what it should look like, and the actual time of day when it should happen in a particular month of a particular year, as indicated in the Corinthian calendar on the metonic dial. In other words, the back face of this machine, if we should call it back, I don't really see why it's the back, but this face of the machine that has these five different dials can tell you with a fair degree of precision when different eclipses have happened all through the repeating cycles of the Corinthian calendar indefinitely into the past and indefinitely into the future. Now, one other note here to take into account is that all of these calculations of the metonic cycle, the Saros cycle, the exaligmos, all of these were slightly imprecise in some way. They might be off by a few hours each. Also, the gear work driving the machine can't be that precise down to a atomic and subatomic level. There are always going to be some tiny imperfections in these handmade gears, which were hand carved and punched, and in how they interact. There always has to be some tiny degree of give. And what that means is that if one were to continually turn the machine forward, representing year after year, century after century, let's say thousands of years into the future, imprecisions would creep in and the different cycles would start to go out of phase so that you couldn't really be sure absolutely exactly when a given eclipse was going to occur in the cycle of a year. So it was not perfect, right? It was highly precise and highly well calibrated for the hand technology of that time, but it wasn't perfect. So as one moved forward far in time or backward far in time, the machine would get more imprecise. And what that implies, of course, is that there must have been some single reference year. There must have been a kind of zero year of the machine that the cycles were understood to start from, such that as one moved forward in time, one had to take into account these growing imprecisions. And it does seem, based on the reconstruction of the gear work, that there was a sort of zero date from which the cycles were understood to begin. And if one got lost... If one lost one's point of reference that one was using and didn't know exactly which metonic cycle or which exaligma cycle one was looking at, one would wind the machine back to this zero date. And it seems that if one turned the machine back such that all the pointers on all the dials throughout this back face were all pointing straight down, in parallel down, that seems to represent a zero date which is August 205 BC. Now, some have argued that that implies that that's when the machine was made, but probably that's not really true. It seems more likely that the reason that arbitrary date was picked is because it also happens to be a moment when the Corinthian calendar lined up with the cycles of the Athenian calendar, another widely used calendar in the Greek-speaking world. 
So it happened to be a sort of convenient zero point that different users might know of and be able to refer back to in order to, you could say, reset the machine and restart your cycles going into the past or the future. And with that in mind, one could forecast with some degree of precision the particular months in which eclipses have happened in the past and would happen in the future. Now, what about if one wanted to know the exact day or night? Well, that might have been impossible, at least as one moved too many centuries or millennia off into the future. It might have been impossible to pinpoint the exact day or night when an eclipse would occur. But one could get pretty close. One simple rule of thumb is that lunar eclipses happen during the full moon. So that means in the middle of the lunar month. So you could say somewhere around night 14 or 15, when the moon is full, that's when a forecast lunar eclipse, according to the machine, is going to happen. And like, likewise with solar eclipses, they only happen during the new moon, when the moon is close to conjunction with the sun. So if one sees, okay, a certain month of a certain year, a possible solar eclipse is forecast, you could suppose it's going to be in the last few nights of the month when there's a new moon. Now it's also possible that one might have come to a more exact forecast of a solar or lunar eclipse by first using the Metonic and Exoligmos and Sauros dials in order to figure out the month when it's expected, and then turning the machine around to the other side and looking at the so-called front or planetary dial, which tracked the forecast motions of the sun, moon, and planets, and also had a little turning sphere within the moon pointer, which showed the phases of the moon. And so once you had determined what month you were looking at when you expected a forecast eclipse, you then would turn around to that front or planetary dial and further gently, precisely adjust your knob until the sun and moon pointers are exactly opposite one another, indicating a full moon and hence the possibility of a lunar eclipse, or turning it so that the sun and moon pointers came into exact alignment one on top of the other, indicating a new moon and the possibility of a solar eclipse. Okay, so we've now turned to the other face of the machine, and we're looking at what has been called the front dial, or what I think should more properly just be called the planetary dial. And we're going completely off script here. I'm just improvising off the top of my head, trying to explain what's going on here. But the front dial is sort of the bell of the ball. It's attracted a lot of attention. It's sometimes the only thing described or referred to in media or popular culture when people talk about the mechanism. Now, to be fair, it is the most complex dial, and it involves the most complicated geometry in order to make the various pointers move in irregular, shifting, sometimes reversing patterns around the dial. But it's also attracted a great deal of attention, I think, out of proportion with its importance, because in a way it's the easiest to grasp and explain what it's about. Right? Well, while it involves very complicated astronomy to try to just break down what the Metonic and Sauros styles even represent. By contrast, the planetary dial is easier to describe what it's doing and how it's supposed to work. It's just one big dial with one center point and seven different pointers that move around it, mimicking the motions of the planets through the heavens. Now, there are more important details in exactly how it does that. So to describe properly this front dial, it has these seven pointers with different markings or imagery on them to mark which planet they represent. Now, what about the scale around it? There are two scales. There's an inner scale closer to the center, which is divided up into 12 sections that are labeled according to the signs of the zodiac the familiar 12 signs that we still use today. Running outside it, there is another scale, which is called the Egyptian calendar scale, which is divided up into 365 little notches representing the days of the Egyptian calendar year. Okay, so why are those the two scales that the pointers on the front dial point to? 
Well, the zodiac one should be relatively simple to explain, right? Just in case anyone isn't already familiar, when one observes the night sky, as ancient Mesopotamian and Greek astronomers did, one sees some objects, namely the planets and the sun and the moon, that seem to move around in shifting irregular patterns, and hence the word planet originally just means wanderer. While, meanwhile, alongside them, or you might say behind them, because that's how many astronomers understood it, there was a dome of what seemed to be fixed stars that remained always in the same unchanging configuration, and that simply rotated around the sky, revolving around the North Star, which seems to be the closest thing to a fixed point, while the rest of these affixed stars, or the firmament, the firmly affixed stars, that are all attached to this one single dome or globe, simply move around in a sim simple rotation. Now, the firmament then provides, alongside things like the horizon that you see around you, the firmament provides a handy frame of reference against which to describe the location of celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and planets, and also the location of celestial events, such as where in the sky a comet or a supernova might appear, or where in the sky an eclipse might occur. And of course, as should be fairly basic knowledge, but just to make it totally clear, ancient astronomers beginning in Babylonia, once again, took this sort of natural map of the firmament, and they divided it up just as a, an arbitrary frame of reference. They divided it up into 12 sections, each of which they named according, supposedly according to the appearance of a constellation in that section of the sky, which they call the zodiac. And the way they divided the sky up was they observed the motions of the sun, which you can't actually see directly, right? Because anytime the sun is up, the sky is all washed out. You can't see the stars. But nonetheless, they surmised by mapping out the constellations that they saw and then observing the moments when the sun rose and set, they figured out, they plotted out where in the firmament the sun was located at any given hour of any given day. And they found that the sun actually moves very slowly through the course of a year. It moves across a, an arced path or a complete circular path through the firmament. And they picked out this line that the sun seems to trace through the firmament as it moves slowly through the year. And they called that the ecliptic. And it's called the ecliptic because eclipses also happen somewhere along that same line. The sun is always located somewhere along the ecliptic, hence every solar eclipse has to happen somewhere along that line. And likewise, lunar eclipses happen when the moon is exactly opposite the sun. In other words, it's going to be 180 degrees on the other side of the ecliptic. So that's why there's that line. We call it the ecliptic. They picked out 12 constellations that roughly run along that ecliptic, so they divided the sky into these 12 slices, which they label by the signs of the zodiac. Okay, the reason why that is useful and important when you're talking about the planets is that when you see a planet like, for instance, Venus, moving in these irregular ways, appearing above the horizon at certain nights, uh, then disappearing again, then appearing on the other horizon, right? so sometimes Venus appears in the evening over in the west, seemingly following after the sun. At other times, it appears early in the morning in the east before the sun and then disappears. Rather than having to track all of these weird loop-de-loops from night to night and month to month and year to year, the Babylonian astronomers found it was much easier just to look at each planet each night and say where it is in the zodiac and hence mark out its rough position against the firmament. That was way simpler, and it, they found that the pathways of each planet through the firmament were complex and irregular, but they were still simple enough that they could be fairly easily tracked and cataloged and found to follow repeating patterns. And each planet traced a different path through the firmament, which would then it would repeat and retrace according to some particular repeating cycle. And the length of each planet's repeating cycle was different. So each given planet 
had what we call a synodic cycle or synodic period. And they're of different lengths for the different planets. And specifically, they've been calculated today to extreme precision down to you know, hours and minutes. In the ancient world, the Babylonians developed estimates of these synodic cycles that were fairly accurate, and then they were even further refined a bit more in the Hellenistic Age, when this astronomical knowledge from Babylon was diffused to many new societies. For example, when it comes to the planet Venus, which is the one that was of greatest interest in the ancient world, that is very visible. Its actual precise synodic period is 583.92 days. And what that means is that, according to modern astronomy, we can be certain that when we observe Venus in a particular spot against the firmament of the stars on a particular night at a particular time, we can be sure it's going to return to that same exact spot again 583.92 days later. In the ancient world, they had calculations of these times that were close enough to accurate. They were not as precise as we have today, but with Venus, it was 584 days. So we know today that's not exactly right down to the fraction of an hour, but it was close enough to be usable. And it seems that the designers who made the Antikythera mechanism had pretty good, fairly precise measurements of these synodic cycles of the five wandering planets. For Mercury, a little bit less than 116 days. For Venus, 584 days. For Mars, a little less than 780 days. For Jupiter, a little less than 399 days. And for Saturn, slightly more than 378 days. So what that means, if we understand that in terms of our planetary geometry, you have to picture each of the planets, the Earth and these other planets that were known at the time, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Each one is revolving around the Sun at a different distance and at a different rate. And furthermore, each orbit of each planet is eccentric. It's not a perfect circle. It's a slightly oblong ellipse. And again, it moves slightly faster at moments when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's farther away. So when a person on Earth observes the position of one of these planets in the sky, they're seeing it there because the Earth, the sun, and that other planet are in a certain triangular configuration. They are passing by, you might say, one another in a particular configuration. Sometimes, of course, they come into perfect alignment, right? Where the, say, the Sun, the Earth, and Saturn might all be in a perfect straight line. And hence, we see Saturn in the zodiac exactly 180 degrees opposite the Sun. And then the planets continue moving. They go out of this alignment. They go through several cycles of revolution of one sort or another. And then they come back into more or less the same configuration. The same configuration at least such that that's close enough that the planet appears to us in the exact same position in the sky once again. And that takes different lengths of time for these different planets, ranging from a fraction of a year for Mercury to several years for Mars. Now, the challenge for the astronomer who made the Antikythera mechanism, or designed it, was how to capture these very different repeating ratios of time, of different periods of days and even fractions of days in gears. So that was one challenge. The other challenge on top of that is that the planets did not move through the zodiac in a single continuous cycle. So whereas you might be able to observe the moon, right, the appearances of the moon each night and track it continuously smoothly moving from west to east through the zodiac. When it came to the planets, it was much more complicated. It doesn't simply move continuously at one rate from sign to sign. Rather, it can move very quickly for a period of a few months, then slow down. Then it can come to a stopping point, a so-called station, where it stays in a sign for some period of time. Then sometimes it can start to move back and that's called retrograde. Astrologers tell you that's, you know, Mars is retrograde because it's at a moment where it's now turned the other way and is moving back westward. But then it might stop again at another station and then start moving eastward again. And these sorts of weird convoluted motions then repeat in these repeating cycles through these synodic periods. 
So if one wants to create a dial where the different pointers represent the motions of a planet through the zodiac from day to day and month to month, one has to do something much weirder and more complicated than just having a gear turn it around the dial. One has to somehow cause the pointer to simulate these motions by speeding up, slowing down, reaching stopping points, going into retrograde motion, continuing again, and so on. And one has to have all the, these seven dials representing these different planets all doing this at the same time. So it seems that the creators of the mechanism, basically what they did is they had pointers with slots in them. So what would happen is the knob would turn the big sort of master gear representing the solar year, which would turn the sun pointer around the dial and show the motion of the sun through the zodiac over the course of a year. Then other gears would branch off from that one, and these other gears would then have pegs or pins rather than just teeth so that a gear turns a gear turns a gear. They would have pegs or teeth set into some point on that gear, and then that would turn and revolve as the gear rotated, right? And then that peg would be slotted into a slot in the base of the pointer representing a planet, such that what you end up with is a gear that moves around as the solar gear rotates. And further, it would turn the peg around in cycles, basically simulating the supposed epicycles of planets going around the Earth. And then that epicyclic peg would then turn the pointer in these irregular shifting patterns, simulating the apparent motions of the planet in the sky. Okay, so I mentioned the term epicycles. Surely some of you know what that means. But basically, to sum up, it seems that the design of the mechanism drew upon and built upon developing astronomical theories in the Hellenistic and Roman age. So certain things we can say are that the Babylonian astronomers meticulously cataloged and then described the shifting motions of the planets through the zodiac but they didn't put forward a theory explaining why they moved in these patterns or what they meant, nor did they try to create three-dimensional models representing how the planets moved. For several hundred years, we know that there were astronomers like Hipparchus and Posidonius who were refining and developing and adding to astronomical knowledge, but we do not know what those astronomers thought or how they theorized the motions of the planets. We don't know that they tried to account for why they moved in these weird irregular repeating patterns or what that meant about how they were actually moving in the three-dimensional space of the cosmos. We do know that in the second century AD, so now well into the Roman era, an astronomer named Ptolemy wrote a book called The Almagest in which he put forward a very complex and refined theory accounting, not only describing the motions of the planets, which had been done many years before, but putting forward a theory of what it meant and why they moved in these apparent weird cycles. And it was based on two basic principles. One is eccentricity, the idea that as planets or bodies like the sun and moon move around the earth, they move in off-center eccentric cycles and hence that accounts for the weird irregularities of when they move faster or slower. Now, of course, today we have a heliocentric astronomy. We say, well, that's not true of the sun and the planets because, in fact, we're moving around the sun in an eccentric path, not the other way around. But nonetheless, Ptolemy's model was good enough to describe and explain the motions of the heavens reasonably well. So the first principle was eccenters and eccentricity. The second principle was epicycles. So why is it that, the, that Venus moves in these weird shifting patterns around the sky? It's because Venus is moving in circles around an invisible center point. And we call these circles around the invisible center point epicycles. And then that invisible center point is moving around the Earth. It's a loop within a loop. And if you understand the motions of the heavenly bodies in this way and describe them mathematically as circles around some point that are in turn moving in an ellipse around the Earth, then 
you can describe and forecast the motions of these heavenly bodies reasonably well. Not as perfectly as would be done in later centuries, but well enough. Now, it seems that the gear work of the Antikythera mechanism basically mimicked this model of the cosmos of planets moving in epicycles around some center point. Those epicycles are then simulated with these gears with pegs, and those epicycles in turn are revolving around the Earth according to the solar year. Okay, so what are the implications of this? Does this mean that as early as the first century BC, about 200 or more years before Ptolemy, these astronomers at this workshop in Rhodes already knew Ptolemy's theories and already knew the mathematics and the geometry behind them. Maybe, or maybe they just had come up with mathematical formulas to describe these patterns of motion, and they knew that they could simulate them with this sort of gear work, whether or not they cared about the theory behind it or the actual geometry of the heavens behind it. All we know is that they cared about precisely accurately representing the motions of these planets and the sun and moon through the firmament as represented by the zodiac from month to month and year to year. And they created these pointers that would simulate these motions as one turned the knob. And hence what that meant in principle is that as one moved the machine and moved the metonic dial, through months and years into the future or into the past, one could then see, at least fairly accurately enough, one could see the motions and positions of these planets, these wandering bodies, as they moved through the firmament. And hence one could reconstruct, roughly enough, the positions and trajectories of the different planets, the position of the sun in the solar year, the position of the moon in the sky, the phases of the moon as represented by the rolling moon ball in any particular month of any particular year you wanted. And if for some reason you wanted to, you could also further align those movements of the planets and the sun and moon with eclipses and know what the configurations of these heavenly bodies were in the sky at moments when eclipses occur past, present, or future. Okay, and there's one last element to consider here that I haven't addressed specifically. All of these dials that I've been talking about all were aligned as they moved. They moved in tandem with the pointer of the metonic and calypic dials, which means that all of these celestial events could be forecast or chronicled forward or backward in time according to the Corinthian calendar which was used in certain places, including Epirus. But what if you want to somehow translate all of these forecasts of different celestial events into other people's calendars and send messages or predictions to somewhere far away, like, like Rome or Etruria? Well, that might be the reason why there is one further scale also added on to the planetary dial, an outer scale that tracks the Egyptian calendar that is divided up into 12 months and five extra days that are all marked out with 365 little markings all around this ring. So the Egyptian calendar, why does it appear there? The Egyptian calendar was another method of marking out time that had certain strengths and weaknesses. Astronomically speaking, it was pretty worthless, but it was useful as an easy reference for tracking out dates in the past and future. Why is that? Well, that's because the Egyptians, in this particular respect, were almost exactly the opposite of the Babylonians. The Babylonians were obsessed with the images of the heavenly bodies and tracking their repeating cycles. And they were avid astrologers. They wanted to align and time human activities with these heavenly events. The Egyptians didn't pay that much attention to the heavenly bodies. They knew they were there, like anybody, and sometimes they even attributed to them some sort of cosmic significance, like the sun god, but they didn't much care about making a calendar that fit with the heavenly events. So the Egyptian calendar was arguably the crudest of the whole ancient world. It was only solar. They didn't, again, like us, they didn't care about the phases of the moon. It was only solar, and it was very rough and crude. It just said, there's a solar year, and it's 365 days long, period. 
they didn't even particularly care to notice that actually the year is slightly longer than just 365 days. They just said every 365 days, a new year begins. And yeah, okay, there's the moon, and it seems to go through these cycles about every 30 days or so. All right, so we'll take our 365-day year, we'll chop it up into months of 30 days each, never mind that that doesn't really align with the actual motions of the moon, and, you know, 30 days of each month, 12 months, that takes up 360 days, you've got five extra days left over, we'll just say those are five sort of bonus days that don't belong to any month. So they had a calendar of just a simple repeating cycle of 365 days. You know, astrologically, if you're like the Babylonians, you'd say that's ridiculous. Your years are going to go out of phases with the seasons. And that is exactly what happened. Each year, the occasions of the ritual calendar, like the New Year's or their different holidays, moved slightly in their position with respect to the actual seasons, whether measured through weather or the flooding of the Nile, or the motions of the sun. And it was a discrepancy that was big enough that you could notice it. People noted like, hey, you know, when I was a little kid, this festival happened at the height of summer. Uh, Now that I'm 50 years old, it's more like the beginning of summer or late spring. These things are out of whack, right? You would notice these shifts decade by decade, let alone century by century. They would go completely out of whack. There was no consistency. So in this way, the Egyptians were at the opposite extreme from the Babylonians. Their calendar was just not precisely calibrated at all. But the benefit of the Egyptian calendar was that it was very simple. You always knew every year was exactly 365 days. There was none of this shifting around. There were no leap days. There were no extra intercalary months. You didn't have to worry about these precise tables or charts or calculations to figure out exactly how long was this year or this month. You just always knew every year was 365 days. And if the same date recurred from year to year, you could just say, how many years back was this from from this particular holiday this year to this other holiday, let's say 100 years earlier? You just knew it was 36,500 days. So what that meant is that, in effect, the Egyptian calendar was very easy and useful as a sort of reference calendar for slotting in different historical events or astronomical or astrological events into a very long time scale of centuries or millennia and being able to just easily calculate how far apart they are in time by just the number of days. So it provides this sort of easy reference scale even though it in and of itself has no real astronomical value. And what that means is it could use it could be used as a, an easy shared scale of reference, like different countries today all using Greenwich Mean Time or using the metric scale of mass. Or you could use the Egyptian calendar as a way to plug in dates from different calendar systems into one shared scale and plot them out along long stretches of time. And something the Egyptians did care about, just as much or more than the Babylonians, was historical chronicles. The chronicles of great events, the reigns of pharaohs, historic battles, and so on. And for that sort of purpose, the Egyptian calendar was useful. So it seems this is probably why, when one looks at the planetary dial, you see the different moving pointers for the heavenly bodies, indicating where they're moving through the zodiac in the firmament. Also, the solar pointer probably was long enough that it extended beyond the zodiac to some point on the Egyptian calendar scale. And that meant that when you were plotting events like, say, an eclipse at some point in the past or future, you could then look at where the solar pointer was pointing on the Egyptian calendar scale and narrow down more or less to a particular day. At least within a certain margin of error, you could pinpoint the particular day of a celestial event and hence you would then have a a date that you could then translate into different calendars. Okay, but you may be noticing something's wrong here, right? How could you pinpoint the particular day in the Egyptian calendar if, as we already said, the Egyptian calendar was out of phase with the real solar year? And hence, depending on whether you're talking about 50 years in the past or 100 years in the past or 30 years in the future, the 
Egyptian calendar is going to be out of whack and variable in relation to astronomical events. Well, you're correct. That is why the Egyptian calendar scale is not a fixed scale engraved directly into the face of the mechanism. That would be worthless. Instead, the Egyptian calendar scale is a removable ring. It is snapped in and out of place in the front face of the mechanism using clips. It can be rotated and put back into place using pegs on the back of the scale ring that slot into 365 different holes around the interior of the machine. So it seems probably the reason why it was there and why it could be used was that whoever operated the machine would have some sort of table or maybe a formula, perhaps in part of the lost sections of the front or back plate engravings, front or back cover plate engravings, which are mostly lost. Perhaps there was some formula or rule of thumb that one could use to take a date in the Corinthian calendar, which would be tracked on the metonic dial, and translate it into a position that the Egyptian calendar scale should be set to on the front plate. And once it was in place, one could then turn the dial to the exact date that one wants and look at the solar pointer and find the exact date of the Egyptian calendar when a particular event like an eclipse should be expected to occur. Okay. So we've basically now covered all the known parts of the Antikythera mechanism. The five different dials on the back face, the planetary dial on the front face. Okay, so the last question to consider, and that I want to talk about a little bit at the end, is what is the point of all this? What was the purpose of this machine? Why would someone want something so extremely complicated? Now. I think there are a number of possible answers to this question, but what I'm going to say is that Alexander Jones, in his book, A Portable Cosmos, which is a great book, he floats a certain claim or argument about what this machine was made for and why it was used. I do not agree with his view that he puts forward in that book, and I'll try to explain why I don't agree and why I see it differently. So Alexander Jones argues that the machine was ultimately an instructional tool. And he argues that astronomical knowledge was not only growing and refining in the Hellenistic and Roman eras, but furthermore, that in the early Roman era, there were a number of astronomers, including Posidonius, who were trying to kind of popularize astronomy to make it more familiar and accessible to the wider reading public in the Greco-Roman world, and that astronomy was becoming more of a regular subject taught in the sort of, you could say, informal or unofficial curriculum, in the sort of array of topics that were usually taught by tutors or schoolmasters to well-to-do upper-class gentlemen and ladies. And Jones believes that the machine was basically made to be used by some high-class tutor or teacher in order to illustrate and demonstrate basic principles of astronomy. I don't think that that is likely. Some of the reasons might be obvious, but I'll try to articulate a main reason, which is that this machine is so complex with so many different functions that are all made to operate together in tandem. There clearly was a tremendous amount of thought and labor put into the precision of this machine and its ability to track astronomical events in time, specifically with the Corinthian calendar. Many people have taught the basics of astronomy through the centuries, from the ancient world through the medieval world in which astronomy was one of the subjects in the university curriculum. It was the final subject of the so-called quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy. And people have taught astronomy in modern times and conveyed the concepts and even maybe the basic mathematics of astronomy without making any reference to a machine like the, without having to use as demonstration, I suppose, a machine that 
tracks the exact types of eclipses that should be expected to recur in precise months of precise years indefinitely into the future and the past. This is just way too much information at way too high a degree of precision to be necessary or even useful in basic instruction in astronomy. I think it is clear from the complexity and the detailed mechanisms in the machine that the purpose of the machine was to come up with very precise dates for specific astronomical events, most importantly eclipses and also motions of the planets, down to the most precise possible date achievable through indefinite periods in the past, present, and future. Why would someone want that? It's not a parlor trick. It's not a classroom exercise. The reason someone would want that is to make astrological forecasts and prognostications. Now, Jones in his book does very explicitly and clearly acknowledge that the Babylonians kept track of these heavenly events, especially eclipses, because they saw them as omens and portents bearing upon human events. And moreover, he does mention with not as much emphasis, but he does mention that in the Hellenistic age, as these Babylonian astronomical observations were diffusing out into the Hellenistic world, there also was a concurrent craze for astrology and for knowledge about how to interpret and make predictions and prognostications on the basis of the heavenly bodies. He also mentions that it was in the Hellenistic age in the 200s BC that the earliest birth charts, what were called at that time horoscopes, but what we would now call simply birth charts, were cast in the Greco-Roman world with the earliest one found in Egypt. And that art, as Jones does not specifically mention, that art also had originated about 200 or so years earlier than that in the 400s BC in Babylonia. So... If this is true, then look at the machine. What does it do? The main thing it does is track as precisely as possible the expected dates of eclipses, the particular types and appearances of eclipses, and the motions of the planets through the zodiac month by month and year by year, and possibly, if you were lucky, even as precisely as day by day. Why would people want to know those two things, eclipses and the motions of the planets? And why would one want to track them, past, present, and future? Well, when it comes to eclipses, eclipses were the most significant, most powerfully portentous public astronomical events that were understood to have public significance, usually negative. Right? An eclipse usually meant something bad was happening to somebody. And Jones does discuss this about how in Babylonia, if a lunar eclipse occurred, there would be a hubbub and a, uh, even a panic around the royal court asking, what does this mean? Does this mean that the ruler is going to be eclipsed, is going to fall from power or die? And there would be a sort of scurrying among the court astrologers to interpret and, if necessary, downplay the meaning of this eclipse for the state. Now, what Jones doesn't get into is the different ways in which this sort of astrological prognostication and interpretation also moved west in the Hellenistic age, and how there was a sort of migration of astrologers, who are often simply called Chaldeans, after the Chaldea region of Mesopotamia. These Chaldeans, or these Magi, spread out all through the Hellenistic world and then the Roman world, selling their services and their supposed wisdom in astrology. And, of course, eclipses, as I said, were the most publicly significant astrological events. What were the most privately significant? Well, when it came to individuals, to private people, say wealthy merchants or, or scholars who might consult with an astrologer, what did they want to know? They wanted to know the positions of the planets in the sky and what they portended for their lives and their actions and their fate. And the most important, the primary way that one would interpret that would be by casting a person's birth chart, which would mean determining the exact positions 
of the planets and other heavenly bodies in the zodiac on the particular date when a person was born. So how handy to have a machine where you can turn a knob, set it to a particular date, and then see the exact positions of the heavenly bodies in the zodiac as they were seen on that date. So I think that all in all it adds up pretty clearly. The Antikythera mechanism is a machine for creating concordances between heavenly events and dates in a human-made calendar, the Corinthian calendar, and also by a further step of calculation, the Egyptian calendar, which can then be used to translate into any other calendar you want. So you could do things like forecast eclipses, cast people's birth charts. Also, one could calculate the positions of heavenly bodies and possible heavenly events at moments like a coronation or someone's taking up or leaving office, exactly the sorts of moments when people wanted to know what the heavenly portents were and whether they portended good or bad, whether they created an auspicious or inauspicious moment. Also, one could do all sorts of other things. What could go in the reverse? One could look deep into these Babylonian or Egyptian chronicles, find, say, for instance, a description of a battle in some distant period in the past, which co-occurred with an event like, say, an eclipse. And there are descriptions of battles in the ancient world that were suddenly interrupted by the sight of an eclipse. One could take the description of that eclipse, turn your machine so that you find where that eclipse would be in your Saros and Exiligmos cycles, and then look, what's the date? <laughs> One could date past astronomical and astrological events. It's a translating machine between human dates and heavenly occurrences, which would have been useful for any number of possible applications, but which would have had great meaning and value, most particularly for astrology, which is basically at root the science or pseudoscience, as the case may be, of the relationship between earthly events and the heavens. And that, I think, is essentially what the Antikythera mechanism was. It was an astrological machine for trying to track and, by extension, analyze the interrelations in time between human events and heavenly events. So again, thank you so much for listening. If you want to hear all of my installments, including my recent patron-only lecture on the history of Bosnia and its relation to the outbreak of the First World War, please go to my Patreon page and sign up at any level, even if it's just a dollar. And lastly, as I said, this lecture is brought to you by the letter J, which is a big one. So I will now specifically thank my patrons whose names begin with J. So thank you to J. Holman, Jack Keenan, Jack Sadler, Jacob Sorrells, James Drake, Jane Feibel, Jane Thomas, Jason A. Baber, Jamie, JBH, Jennifer Serby, Jenny, Jeremy Mahar, Jersey Slavinsky, Jesse Fader, Jim Howell, Joe Kurtz, Joel Star Avalos, John Baber Lucero, John Shea, John Sullivan, Jombo, John, John Green, Jonah Horwitz, Jonas Hackmeister, Jonathan Hu, Jonathan Powers, Joseph Hay, Joseph Murray, Joshua, Joshua Graves, Joshua Maravelias, jsatin at gmail.com, Judy Siskind, Julia Amin, and June. So thank you, and I'll also take this moment to thank specifically Jim Howell, who I listed off, who currently adjusted his pledge so that at this moment it is my largest single pledge in the entire roster. So a special thank you to Jim Howell, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.